Ladies and gentlemen, VIP guests, Uncle Alan Madden, we are meeting here today on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land, to elders past, present and emerging, and to all Aboriginal people here today. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the National Trust Heritage Awards Ceremony for 2021. It feels very special to be gathered here today in person and celebrating the achievements of so many people. These are people who dedicate their time, talent, passion, and in many cases, their whole careers to conserving and caring for the heritage of New South Wales. We are celebrating innovation, creativity, diversity and inclusion to how heritage is being interpreted and celebrated. Our heritage is precious. It is precious to us who treasure the past and honour its truth, its stories and the importance of paving a way to the future. It is precious for our future generations. It is for that very reason that our theme for this year's Australian Heritage Festival is our heritage for the future. Understanding and appreciating heritage fosters a more inclusive, compassionate, connected community. In the face of a global pandemic that has kept us at home, isolated us from loved ones, and shut the doors to the places we love to visit and the events we enjoy, we have craved connection to each other and to our heritage. We have seen this at the National Trust, with the community coming back to our beautiful historic house museums and gardens by the thousands since the middle of the year, middle of last year that is. It's wonderful to welcome each and every person back. Despite the challenges of the past 12 months, we received almost 100 entries to this year's National Trust Heritage Awards. That tells us heritage is important and a significant field of endeavour. We are joined here today by very special guests. First, Uncle Alan Madden, who will welcome us to country shortly. The Honourable Don Harwin, the Minister for Heritage, will join us a little later. The Honourable David Shoebridge, member of the New South Wales Legislative, Legislative Council. The Chair of the Heritage Council of New South Wales, Mr. Frank Howarth, who will be speaking to us today. Mrs. Judy Mundy, one of Heritage's greatest supporters alongside the late, great Jack Mundy, who we all miss so dearly. Our keynote speaker, who was last year's chair of the judging committee, and this year joins us as the National Trust Director of Conservation, Mr. David Burden. David commenced with us in August last year following the retirement of Mr. Graham Quint, who fought the good fight for heritage and the National Trust for 40 years. Graham joins us today with his wife, Judy, and I'm pleased to say we have three generations because we are also joined by Jackie Goddard today. So, welcome. The Executive Director of Heritage New South Wales, Ms. Pauline McKenzie, our Chief Executive Officer, Ms. Debbie Mills, and of course, our Master of Ceremonies, ABC's Simon Marnie. We welcome those of you who are here today, and we also welcome those of you who are watching on live stream from across New South Wales. Today's event would not be possible without the generous support 
of our principal sponsor, the New South Wales Government and the Heritage Council of New South Wales. Our event sponsors, Laithwaite's The Wine People and Dalton House. Our media sponsors, Edelman. We thank you all for helping the National Trust play a lead role celebrating the very best of heritage in the past year. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Uncle Alan Madden. Thank you. Once again, my name is Alan Madden, Gadigal Elder. Ministers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, gives me great pleasure looking around this room and see a lot of my mob here. Old greyhead mob. <laughs> Married man. Hmm. Ten children. Twenty-six grandchildren. And fourteen great-great-grandchildren. <laughs> Just to keep the heritage alive. For my first song, <laughs> nah, only kidding. As we've all welcomed the country's first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge our Aboriginal elders, all elders, past and present, and pay my respects to all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters. From whatever Aboriginal or island nation you may have come from, welcome to Gadigal. And to all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters here today, a very warm and sincere welcome to you, to Gadigal. No matter where you've come from, whether it be across the seas, across the state, or across town, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you, to Gadigal. And as I've mentioned many times before, was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. Only three things sure than that, coming, taxation and going. It's an honour and pleasure to be here today, today to welcome one and all to Gadigal. Gadigal is one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bounded by nature's own. The Hawkesbury River to the north, the Pean to the west and George's River to the south. And in between those three mighty rivers is the Eora Nation. And in that nation, there are 29 clans. And the clans land we're on today is Gadigal. On behalf of members of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. And as you travel across these traditional lands and waters, May the spirits of our ancestors guide, look over you, and keep you safe. So once again, on behalf of Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome to the Gadigal land, Uncle Alan Madden. Would you now please join me in welcoming to the stage the National Trust Heritage Awards Judging Panel Chair, Matt Devine. Please welcome Matt Devine. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I realised recently that for over half my life I have somehow been involved with the National Trust as a member on technical committees and even for a few years as an employee and I'm truly proud of my relationship with this remarkable organisation. As such I'm always delighted to be on the awards jury and as per previous years the judges and I were very excited to see what was entered in the awards and this year the calibre was outstanding. Of course, as a professional working in the built environment, I do love the conservation projects. It's hard to say that I don't. Built landscape and objects. 
Um, there was there was some really exciting conservation projects this year, from important theatrical collections to pipe organs, small cottages, cathedrals, to interwar housing complexes, plus brilliant adaptive reuse projects too. The indigenous category always seems to inspire me and makes me want to know and understand more. In the education, interpretation, events, exhibition and tours categories, I got thrilled by the numerous entries. At times I got regretful for things that I'd missed out on. Um, and, but at the same time, now I feel compelled to travel across the state to actually experience some of the things that are out there. And the stories that these entries tell are rich and diverse. About, migrant, about children migrants in Molong, fire engines, rare and endangered plant species, and things that are made in Marrickville. We particularly love the completion of long-term community-driven and community-funded projects. And these ones are quite remarkable because they show determination and persistence from those community groups. Some examples of this were the Catholic Cathedral in Bathurst and the pipe organ at the Hunter Bailey Church. And we're always pleased to acknowledge adv advocacy campaigns. The National Trust as an advocacy organisation is always pleased to you know, be recognise community activism on heritage issues. Congratulations to all the entrants for all their hard work. And thanks to the judges too. Most of the judges are at this table here. Um, judging is hard work, but it's also an honour as an opportunity to learn about important and interesting projects, publications, promotion and events happening across New South Wales. So I'd like to, if the judges could stand for me. No? Well, one of them saying determinedly no. So, so David, that means you too. So this year we have Phil Bennett, Dr Noni Boyd, David Burden, Miranda Furman, Dr Siobhan Lavelle, Lisa Newell and Sinea Norton. So thanks to the judges for all their hard work. And I hope you have a great day. There's some amazing projects that you'll, that you'll learn about. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you so much for chairing this year's National Trust Heritage Awards judging panel. One of the hallmarks of this awards program is the rigour, expertise and independence of the judging process. And that simply would not be possible without the time and talent of those involved. It is important to note that being a judge for the awards is a voluntary role. The National Trust is so grateful to, for the way all of those involved give so freely of their time. Last year, the National Trust Heritage Awards went virtual and were hosted by our very own Vanilla Kernemone. What a great job she did. But back with us this year on stage and on screen is ABC Sydney morning host, the one, the only, Simon Marnie. Please welcome Mr. Simon Marnie. Damn, and here was I trying to get away with being Tim Ross. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having us here. Did you notice that Tim did the very fashionable late entry, but he did bring a note, so it's okay. Get your face out of your hands, Tim. Nice to see you here as a big supporter. And it is also nice to see Judy Mundy here. And Judy, I have a CD of the beautiful Sunday brunch that we did with Jack that I want to give to you so that you've got that. But 
Welcome and also thank you to uh, Uncle Alan. It is Gadigal land. I come from Bidjigal land here to you today, but in the words of Dara Gadigal, I say, Warami Inga Ni Naya Simon Mani, and thank you for protecting the lands on which I'm privileged to stand. So, hello to everybody here at Daltone House. Isn't it good to be sitting in a room? For those who would like to recreate last year, just get your mobile phone out, sit at your desk and don't talk to anybody. Hello to everybody watching us at their desks, in boardrooms, in bedrooms, lounge rooms and possibly bathrooms. Welcome to these awards. Give them a wave. This is the transformed world brought to you by COVID-19 and it's disconnected us in many ways but also as you will know, increased connections in many others. So you can stay connected by all means, but please can you switch your phone to silent if you haven't already done so. But we will not stop you from using the socials, which is at National Trust AU, hashtag Heritage Awards New South Wales, or you can also do hashtag, gee, Simon Marnie doesn't look as old as he sounds on the radio. I did touch on the bathrooms. For those of you who have not been to Daltone House previously, they are that way and that way. And COVID-19 regulations do stipulate that we're here to remain seated. Now that of course is not the case if you need to go to the bathroom. In fact, we'd prefer that you stand up and make your way to them. Dalton's wonderful waiting staff will attend to you as you need for drinks and food and will be served a delicious two-course lunch today with a lovely selection of wines from Lathwaite's. And let's give them a round of applause because let's face it, <laughs> any wine company that donates to the National Trust is a very generous wine company. For those who have attended or watched previously, we blitz through these awards. And I'm looking now and we are four minutes in front of time. I want to finish five minutes in front of time. We've got 10 categories to go through, three individual awards, a judge's choice will be presenting and each of the 10 categories has a short list. Some entries may receive a highly commended award and we'll announce those first. And then there are winners or a winner in each category. Now take notes because I will be asking questions later. We'll announce those entries that have been highly commended today, but in the interest of safe practice and to maintain physical distancing, your highly commended certificates will be posted to you in the mail. If you are a winner, listen. Make your way to the stage and collect your trophy from that side. There. Then you step onto the stage, you have your photo taken, and then come to the lectern to give your acceptance speech. There are a lot of winners to celebrate, there's a lot to say, but, and it's a big but, in the interest of all of us getting home before dinner, I will ask that winners keep their thank you speeches to one minute. One minute it is, it's a strict one minute, and Tim Ross and I will bag you out if you go over that time. And Tim, if you happen to have to give a speech, it applies to you as well, all right? One minute, I'll be timing it. As you can see on your programs, there are a couple of each there are a couple on each of the table, and we'll still be hearing from David Burden, the Director of Conservation at the National Trust, who will deliver the keynote speech today while lunch is served. And for those live streaming, help yourself to a sandwich, a heritage sandwich, maybe, you know, egg sandwich. We'll take a very short break of five minutes and then we'll jump straight into the announcements of the awards part one. Frank Howarth, Chair of the Heritage Council of New South Wales, will then speak. The award announcements will continue until we're joined by the Minister for Heritage, the Honourable Don Harwin, who will announce the judge's choice and will include, conclude the awards at 2.30. Yes, not 2.39, not 2.35, but 2.30. No matter where you are, you can be a part of the conversation and follow the conversation. I'm talking to you, Zoomland, and that is at National Trust AU, hashtag Heritage Awards New South Wales. But one man who is definitely part of the ongoing conversation on heritage is David Burden. The National Trust Director of Conservation joins us today as our keynote speaker. Put your hands together and give him a warm welcome.
Thank you, Simon. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this event is uh, all about recognising and celebrating our heritage and, and what it means to us today. And so I, too, would like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Aura Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to extend my thanks uh, to the Minister, who, who's not here yet, but will be coming, uh, and, of course, the Chair of the Heritage Council for their attendance, uh, and acknowledge their ongoing contribution towards today's event and to heritage in New South Wales more generally. The other day I was driving back uh, from the Trust's Riversdale property at Goulburn and I was listening to an interview on the radio with the new Anglican Archbishop of Sydney. And the question was asked of him, what makes a good sermon? And anyone who knows me knows I do lots of things at the last minute, so I thought, oh, this could be helpful in preparing today's speech. I thought uh, the first thing that the Archbishop said was very interesting. He said he was fortunate that he loved his topic. And I thought, well, I, I have that advantage as well. All my life I've loved old buildings and I've had a career as an architect and I've worked on them and managed to design them and repair them and understand them. And now in this role I get to, to talk about them and advocate for them. The second piece of advice was just as unhelpful really in preparing the speech and he said that he was lucky his audience also liked his topic. And I thought, well, that's good because I'm preaching to converted here as well. Uh, so I, I think that the most important thing he left out for Simon as well was that uh, you should keep them to 10 minutes as well. Uh, so with that in mind, let's talk about heritage. I think we all missed it last year when this event was rather suddenly cancelled. Uh, but in this age of COVID, we have in many areas of our lives uh, undertaken a bit of a reassessment of our priorities. It's provided us a, a time to think and reflect. Uh, and in many people's cases, it's been a time to reassess the importance of our natural and built environment. Our parks have never been busier. Our sun-filled streets have never felt more important to us. It's also provided an opportunity for many businesses and organisations with a chance to take stock and reassess how they're going about things. We're reprioritising our public spaces and the review of the Heritage Act that the Minister has announced affords us an opportunity to look at how we can best protect our heritage in the future. But one of the phrases that has stuck with me from this period has been the constant advice we've always seen on the television, uh, particularly early on, where they're saying, we're listening to the experts. The first time I heard this, I thought, finally. But I suppose in heritage terms, at least, this depends on what our experts are saying. I think we need to realise that the threats to our heritage are not new. There have always been ideas and proposals that will threaten important places. Sydney's population was approaching 4 million when Bob Carr famously declared it full in 2000. And the Department of Planning now projects that Greater Sydney's population will grow to approximately 6.6 .6 million by 2036. No wonder our heritage is under constant pressure. And it makes it even more important for us to preserve it in a meaningful way for future generations. There's some comfort in the fact that people before us have led that way. In 1877, in London, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings was established. Then, just as now, people were concerned by the proposals to undertake totally insensitive alterations and repairs to their ancient buildings. The founders of that society, who were led by the likes of Philip Webb and William Morris and John Ruskin, they were outraged by the defacement that had occurred at St Albans Cathedral in England. Uh, in the name of restoration, it was a, a, a defacement by the amateur architect, which is never a good starting point, Baron Grimthorpe. And it just happened to get worse because Baron Grimthorpe thought he would be the main contributor to the works as a donor. So much ancient fabric was removed, stone up to a thousand years old, just to be improved with Baron Grimthorpe's imagined and improved version. It was a call to action. I love the fact that a key part of their response was to prepare a manifesto. They had the good writers and the socialist tendencies and so out it came. The manifesto still guides the work of the SPAB to this day 
and in many parts of it is fresh then, uh, at fresh today as it was then. We think, said William Morris and Philip Webb, that if the present treatment of our ancient buildings be continued, our descendants will find them useless for study and chilling to enthusiasm. In the course of this double process of destruction and addition, the whole surface of the building is necessarily tampered with, so that the appearance of antiquity is taken away from such old parts of the fabric as are left, and there is no laying to rest in the spectator the suspicion of what may have been lost. In short, a feeble and lifeless forgery is the final result of all of this wasted labour. The past is the past, and we need to be careful in the way that we treat it. We need to respect that old building or that old tree. Stave off decay by daily care was the mantra of the SPAB. And that's a guideline that continues to make economic, environmental and conservation sense. Perhaps that's why I love the shortlisted project so much for the repair of all the original windows in the Greenway Flats at Kirribilli. It was just repairing windows. It wasn't throwing them all away to landfill and replacing them with some inferior aluminium thing that's easy for some bozo to insert. It was giving another 70 years of life to something that was perfectly serviceable. That project to me encapsulates exactly what those early conservationists were promoting all of those years ago. It's not about being trapped in time and never changing anything. It's about maintaining and preserving original, useful fabric. It's about recognising something that has value. Many of you might be sitting there thinking, well, in Australia, we, we have our own manifesto in the Borough Charter. But how often have we seen that document cited at the, as the guiding force at the start of a heritage report by a consultant? I need to read on and wonder where that guidance has led them at the end of that report. <laughs> when, when the authors of that venerable charter wrote that new work should be discernible from old, I wonder whether they had that insensitively placed glass box in mind or that adjacent tower as a backdrop to a small house. It's those controversial projects where we listen to the experts and where we all have a responsibility. For every horrible heritage outcome, more often than not, there is a heritage report that justifies it. Sure, let's have that discussion. For it's generally those things that are worth protecting that we find are worth arguing about. We need progress and we need creative thinking. But sometimes we also just need to say, no, what we have here is good and it's valuable. We should keep this. <laughs> and to this room I say, sometimes as experts, we need to give just that advice. And to the broader community, we need to listen to those experts. I don't think I've ever been as depressed in my whole life as when I was last in New York City and I was walking through Pennsylvania Street Station. Anyone who's been there knows the nine foot tall underground tunnels lined with acoustic ceiling panels. And then all of a sudden I came across it, the interpretation panel. It showed the original waiting room of the former Pennsylvania Street Station in all of its glory. That was an internal space that was 100 metres long. It was 46 metres tall. It was modelled on the baths of Diocletian in Rome. It was made of granite and marble and precious stones. It was all demolished in 1963 to make way for some air rights. As the architectural historian Vincent Scully noted at the time, one used to enter New York City like a god, and now we scurry in like rats. It was a tragedy. It was a galvanizing moment for the US conservation movement, and Jacqueline Kennedy was a big part of that. But perhaps the editor of the New York Times at, at that time summed it up best when he said, any city get, gets what, it's want, what it wants. 
is willing to pay for and ultimately deserves. How fortunate for my generation that our own Queen Victoria building or the Mile Lakes did not suffer that same fate before I was even born. We simply take those things for granted now. But as they say, the price of victory is eternal vigilance. The baton has been passed. Maybe we are the designer, the assessor, the client, the National Trust, the public. We all have our role to play in Australian conservation. We are all responsible for shaping that pervading attitude that allows those things to happen. We can make preservation the norm and not the option. Every year, these awards show us the best there is in heritage. They show us how creative approaches to our heritage can be achieved, how we can adaptively reuse existing structures, how our historic buildings and cultural landscapes can inspire the best in contemporary design, how people can enjoy engaging with historic places and objects in meaningful ways. These projects, they set the standard and I thank you all for your work towards them. They provide the best examples for others to follow. If these awards can help us change that attitude, then they will have achieved their goal. Maybe they could result in a little new manifesto for us here. I'm a bad poet, but here we go. Change will come, and so it should. For just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. So if it is broken, we could simply just mend it. But when it is good, we should vigorously defend it. Thank you. I do love the conversations that are going on at the National Trust's Heritage Award tables around. Oh, if only we could, for those listening and watching on Zoom, have mics on each one of the tables. It would be wonderful. We are back and let's get things underway with the presentation of this year's National Trust Heritage Awards. We were welcomed earlier to Gadigal Land by Uncle Alan Madden. And for those of us at Doltone House today, as he said, we meet on Gadigal Land. Land of the Eora Nation always was and always will be. But many of you are joining us from the lands of traditional owners across the nations. And you've travelled here today and many of you are watching from afar. This awards ceremony and the celebration of heritage is very much about place. The places, the stories, the heritage of Australia starts with the story of our First Nations. The Aboriginal Heritage category for the National Trust Heritage Awards recognises and celebrates projects, initiatives, events, exhibitions, publications or programs that get, create a greater understanding, celebration, but primarily and importantly, acknowledgement of Aboriginal heritage and history. So, this year, our shortlist consisted of two outstanding projects. The first one, the Aboriginal culture-inspired play space at the Leagues Club Park in Gosford, entered by the Hunter Central Coast Development Corporation. And Walking on Country, entered by Shoalhaven City Council, And the winner is Leagues Club Park in Gosford, entered by the Hunter Central Coast Development Corporation. The judges were incredibly impressed by the opportunity taken to transform this gateway site to the Central Coast region and create a place that achieves so many things so wonderfully. The 2.4 hectare site was co-designed with the Darkenjung Local Aboriginal Land Council and with local Aboriginal artists. The result is a dynamic space where the community experiences the story of country, 
comes together to appreciate the abundant life in the surrounding natural envi environment and the tidal pool is very special and it's all done in the spirit of appreciation and joy. The judges commented on how interactive and carefully this space had been created and for younger generations or the young at heart, the playground is seriously awesome. Congratulations to our winner for the Habor Aboriginal Heritage category this year. Thank you, it's so nice to be here and what an absolute honour to win this really special award. Not only for the outcome, the cultural outcomes that the park actually is very um, obvious in, but also in the enduring partnership that the Hunter and Central Coast Development Corporation had with the Darkenjung Local Aboriginal Land Council and Turf Design Studio. And I'm really pleased that they're all here with us to celebrate today. Thank you to the team at the Hunter and Central Coast Development Corporation, Nicola Robinson, Pavla Board, Luke Robertson, for embedding Aboriginal heritage well and truly early on in the design brief, and then taking that through all the way to delivery and for their personal and really authentic engagement throughout the project on that theme. Thank you to Mike Horn and Scott Jackson from Turf Design Studios. Their enthusiasm for this theme was boundless. Thank you for your creativity and your innovation and your constant desire to do more and more in the park. Also, thank you to Gabby Duncan and the Darkenjung Local Aboriginal Land Council who truly partnered with us from the very, very beginning. They came along to early design meetings, took cultural site tours, um, local artistry was involved and they also created some of the amazing pieces that you can see in the, in the park. Thank you for trusting us and working with the Hunter and Central Coast Development Corporation and Turf Design Studio in together, in partnership, creating an inclusive play space, but also a cultural beating heart for the Gosford community for everybody to enjoy. Thank you. One minute, 12 seconds. <laughs> Could do better but nicely done. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> On to conservation of built heritage, which is the big one in terms of volume of entries. In fact, there were 18 entries for this category alone, so if you are shortlisted, well done. And to recap on that, our shortlist for this year in the conservation of built heritage category is as follows. Kame 2020 Alpha House Restoration, entered by New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service. <laughs> Australian Museum Project Discover in Sydney, entered by the Australian Museum and Orwell and Peter Phillips. The earlier alluded to Greenway Window Conservation and Upgrade Project in Milsons Point entered by Land and Housing Corporation, Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. <laughs> the Lowy Institute in Sydney entered by Hector Abrahams Architects. Keep it going, keep it going. 19 to 15 Pawley Street, Surrey Hills, Conservation and Upgrade Project, entered by the New South Wales Land and Housing Corporation, Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. <laughs> the restoration of the Cathedral of St Michael and St John in Bathurst, entered by the Cathedral of St Michael and St John Bathurst. And finally, Shell House, as part of the Brookfield Place Development, Sydney, entered by Adriel Consultancy, who worked in partnership with GML Heritage, Make and Brookfield. <laughs> so the judges recognised the following projects with a highly commended award in this category. Now remember? Those entrants will receive their certificates delivered to the entrance address after the ceremony. In other words, the cheque's in the mail. Our highly commended entrants are Pawley Street, Surrey Hills, entered by the New South Wales Land and Housing Corporation, Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. And also the other highly commended entrant is Australian Museum Project Discover, entered by the Australian Museum and Orwell and Peter Phillips. 
So we have three winners in this category that just could not be different if they tried. Firstly, the restoration of the Cathedral of St Michael and St John Bathurst. This has been an extensive project restoring the building fabric of Australia's second oldest cathedral, but also extending its endurance for another century so that it continues to be a core part of the Bathurst community as a very treasured place of worship. The judges were blown away by the investment in craftsmanship and that this is really is a community project largely funded by members of the community who donated through fundraising initiatives. Congratulations. Don't forget to select your trophy, come up for the socially distanced photo. And one minute. I say three thank yous. Uh, thank you to the National Trust for uh, this recognition and thank you to the National Trust for being here. Um, second, uh, I'd like to thank all those who worked on the project and everyone who has donated to it. And finally, I thank God that we had uh, a safe workplace um, which gave meaningful employment to many people and also raised up a new generation of artisans. So thank you. No, clap louder, 46 seconds. He kicks, he scores, the second winner. And hopefully coming in at under 46 seconds is Shell House Sydney, entered by Adriel Consultancy, who worked in the partnership with GML Heritage, Make and Brookfield Projects. <laughs> Part of a broader project, the Brookfield Place, Sydney Development, this win recognises the work to date on the exceptional standard of the rapport, re restore and restoration work of the exquisite, uh-oh, faience, faience. Don't have the standing committee on spoken English when you need it, do you? Faience terracotta facades and clock tower for the 65.5 metre high shell house facing Wynyard Park. So please, welcome to the stage, our winners. I am so excited about being here because this project um, has been an outstanding one in terms of partnership. I'm very pleased to see a major property owner and a major city construction firm here at the awards and winning this prize. We've been a great team. Um, thank you to all of you, particularly Brookfield, for listening. Um, you always listened, and I think I'm probably one of the nicest me people to spend money with. We've done, you've done an incredible job. I'm very glad that, excited to see this award being recognised in this way. Um, the table here has got, um, again, multiplex construction, the site engineers and the management here, and they're the boys who did it and made it work. Thank you, boys, and thank you, and the rest of the, and GML Heritage and TTW, they were a great team, and Mitchell Allen, um, Brookfield, who signed all my checks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very pleased and great congratulations to Brookfield and thank you, National Trust. Very nice. One minute and one second. 
And that's shared between two people. Round of applause. The last, but certainly not the least in this category is for the built heritage, is the Greenway Window, Con window Conservation and Upgrade Project in Milsons Point. Everyone in Sydney knows the Greenway building. I used to drive by it all the time as a kid and I still do as an adult. It's a landmark building on the northern Sydney skyline. It was constructed between the years of 1948 and 1954. But what blew the judges away was the scale of the project. The steel windows for the 309 apartments that are located four storeys or 12 storeys up were originally supplied by Connolly Limited and one of the most distinctive features of the building's architecture. There was extensive consultation with all the residents at Greenway to ensure that all the windows were replaced in the same style to maintain the building's heritage value and housing design. That is quite an undertaking and a well-deserved award goes to the entrance. Good afternoon all. Look, the Land and Housing Corporation is extremely honoured to uh, accept this award uh, in recognition of the large scale uh, conservation project that we undertook at the Greenway building. It involved an extraordinary uh, amount of cross collaboration with both our colleagues in Department of Communities and Justice and a range of other stakeholders. This project highlights Land and Housing Corporation's ongoing commitment to uh, recognise our heritage values. It, across our portfolio and to enhance social housing across New South Wales. We have a mammoth responsibility maintaining in, a, in excess of 125,000 social housing and public housing properties um, worth almost or uh, more than $50 billion. The passion and commitment of our staff is absolutely extraordinary and this must be acknowledged and, and commended. As, you, as we mentioned, the Greenway building was built between 1948 and 1954, has 309 units, and this conservation project was done in great sensitivity with uh, making sure that our tenants could remain in situ while we undertook this work, and we're really, really proud of it. Um, we'd like to thank the National Trust for this recommendation, our recognition, and also for the award. Thank you so much. And look, I gave you 20 extra seconds because it's a vital uh, that our social housing is encouraged as well. So well done. Thank you. Hey, Tim, I can think of another social housing place not far from here that would be nice to see in the public, wouldn't it? Now, we move to the outdoors and celebrate excellence in the conservation of landscape heritage. We had one project shortlisted, so guess who won? <laughs> Aspire Stonemasonry for the conservation and landscape ca heritage category for their entry, Spain's Wharf, Caraba Point. Named in honour of Alderman J.S. Spain in 1937 and overlooking Sydney Harbour, Spain's lookout contains remnants 1930s furniture and Depression-era work scheme elements such as concrete fences and paving. During the Depression, state and local governments created public work projects to help create jobs. These are often quite distinctive and important and the work undertaken to restore and maintain the Depression-era stonework that defines the landscape of this very special place in Sydney has been recognised with this award. Thank you, Thank you National Trust. Uh, for this award, this really means so much to me in the pra my practice as a stonemason. Uh, the Spain's Lookout project at Caraba Point, bestowed upon me by North Sydney Council, has saved such a historically important feature of Sydney's harbour foreshore. For that I am extremely grateful. And to be recognised as a stonemason who is in the eyes of his peers a custodian for future generations. I could not have done this without the help of Hugh Goodman, Streets Alive Project Officer, 
and Jean-Michel Ferrier. But most of all, the two women sitting over there, Monica and Mary Jakovic, or as I like to call them, M&M, they are truly my <laughs> inspiration in life. Thank you once again, National Trust, for this award, prestigious award. And Katie, this is for you. <laughs> Thank you. Kicks and scores with a heartfelt dedication and coming in at 53 seconds. Give him a round of applause. Oh, I'm loving this. On to Adgifus, Ad, Adgif, Adgif, speaking out on issues. Advocacy suffers a little with a perception issue. There is a sense that advocacy is about the angry mob, the crusader, the raisers of the rabble. And it is, yes, and it is about that a lot of the time, let's face it. If you don't, you just don't get noticed. But it is also more than that. Advocacy for the protection of heritage and the safekeeping of the places the community treasures requires tenacity. To advocate is an exercise in endurance, influence, lots and lots and lots of conversations and writing to the right people, mobilising and organising people, and for some people, it's even their full-time job. I'm looking at you, David Burden, for, for others, it's their part-time passion. In many cases, we're talking about people who donate endless hours of their spare time standing up for what they believe in and fight the good fight. And today, we're celebrating all types of heritage advocacy here. Our shortlist in this category is the conservation of the Mulgoa Valley as a cultural landscape entered by the Friends of Fernhill and Mulgoa Valley Incorporated. Save Willow Grove in Parramatta, entered by the North Parramatta Residents Action Group. It's so good to see you guys have all done the overtaking shyness classes. <laughs> Out of your shells and there. The highly commended entry is Save Willow Grove, entered by the North Parramatta Residents Action Group. So, of course, the winner is the conservation of the Mulgoa Valley as a cultural landscape. Entered by the Friends of Fernhill and Mulgoa Valley Incorporated, the judges recognised the painstaking work involved in this project, extensive stakeholder engagement and documentation to support the conservation and state heritage listing of the Mulgoa Valley as a cultural landscape and the cultural and natural heritage of Fernhill Estate. In particular, this award acknowledges the collaboration of a very disparate group to conserve this remarkable place. Thank you, Simon. And I must say, this is a very unexpected achievement. And can I acknowledge the Willow Grove people? Because we really didn't anticipate this. Um, yes, we've set the bar very high. We wish to conserve 5,500 hectares adjacent the Aerotropolis. And so it is... A, a gargantuan task, but we feel it's very important. And the Friends of Fernhill is a, a fledgling group, but the advocates that make up the Friends of Fernhill collectively would have over 200 years of advocating for the Mulgoa Valley between us. So we have been long established. We think that we could preserve a unique landscape in the Sydney Basin uh, for future generations to enjoy and appreciate. Uh, something that is very special. So thank you very much. You can see why I have them on the radio. 36 seconds, kicks and scores. Thank you very much. Oh, you always do. And then you get 45. <laughs> Let's celebrate the conservation of interiors and objects next. For the uninitiative, uninitiated, this category recognises the people with excruciatingly high levels of attention to detail. These are the people that conserve 
documents, collection items, intricate pieces of jewellery, ornaments, lights and lampshades, furniture and fabrics, postcards and pillboxes, libraries, and we know they rock, and the books in them. I could go on and on. These objects can be huge or they can be really tiny, but they tell a big story and they fascinate and ignite the imaginations of people who appreciate heritage and history. So our shortlist this year was conservation of the Art Gallery of New South Wales Bass Reliefs in Sydney, entered by the International Conservation Services and the Art Gallery of New South Wales. <laughs> Preserving and promoting Australia's theatrical heritage from storage rooms to performing arts archive and community performance spaces in Sydney, entered by Seaborn Broughton and Walford Foundation. and the restoration of the historic 1890 William Hill and Son organ in the Hunter Bailey Memorial Presbyterian Church, Annandale, entered by the Hunter Bailey Conservation Subcommittee. <laughs> the judges have highly recommended preserving and promoting Australia's theatrical heritage from storage rooms to performing arts archive and community performance spaces in Sydney, by, entered by Seaborn Broughton at Walford Foundation. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> and the winner is the restoration of the historic 1890 William Hill and Son organ in the Hunter Bailey Memorial Presbyterian Church in Annandale, entered by the Hunter Bailey Conservation Subcommittee with the support of Ralph Lane OAM. We talked about the tenacity in advocacy earlier and the judges certainly recognised the perseverance on this project which took over a decade to complete. The dedication and skill in restoring the organ in the 1889 landmark English Gothic style church in Sydney's inner west has earned this project the award in this category. I'm sorry Simon, I have to correct you with two decades. Two decades. <laughs> 1997 to 2017, and um, I hope I won't outstay my welcome at the podium as a, an ex-colleague of yours from ABC. I'll try and make sure that I restrict myself to the time available. Um, and I want to present this to the National Trust. Um, they were in many ways responsible for the restoration being completed because the church enjoyed the privilege of having a National Trust sponsored restoration appeal for both the church and the organ. So the people who donated, um, <clears throat> so I'll give that to the National Trust and also I've got about 40 CDs which I'll leave here if anybody would like to take one with them at the end of the proceedings today. So um, in line with uh, Neil's um, uh, address about the looking to the future, um, it's certainly the case where an organ um, suffers from uh, friction and, and all sorts of things that stop it playing and it was great that the organ was allowed to be uh, preserved and um, to go on for future generations, both splendid in sound and in appearance. Uh, I'd like to thank the three organ builders who were concerned over those 20 years. Um, uh, the Dukes Company in Sydney, uh, the late Mark Fisher, um, and who was um, on the project for a good um, 12 years, and um, Campbell Hargraves from Melbourne, who completed the final stage when Mark was seriously ill. I want to thank the beverages who are here today because it was back in the mid-90s that they sowed the seed of having the organ restored. It was a project that we could um, actually envisage completing unlike the restoration of the church, which is just a cool $4 million. And I'd like to finally thank my wife, Caroline, because she was such a, um, a sport for me over all that time, or well, certainly since 2000 when we married. So I, I really thank her for her support over all that time. Thank you very much. Time
timed out to the news perfectly. Right, I haven't lost my touch, Simon. You timed out at 59.93. say that it was, and they also say that it was Simon's program which regularly advertised the concerts of the church, which made restoration possible. And I always would refer to the graffiti on the wall that said, uh, went back to, I think, the late 70s, where it said, in, ni in the hours of three o'clock in the morning, eight uranium trucks passed this That's site. That's the one. That's the place. <laughs> See, even graffiti can be heritage listed. I might go out and do some right now. Congratulations, well done on the 59 seconds, but now we'll pause for a moment on the presentation of the National Trust Heritage Awards to hear from the Chair of the Heritage Council of New South Wales, which is one of the key supporters of today's event. Please welcome to the stage, Frank Howarth. A supporters gallery up the back there. Um, I, uh, hello everybody from the Heritage Council. I, I would also like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and uh, thank Al Uncle Alan for his wonderful introduction. Also um, acknowledge the colleagues from the National Trust, um, Neil Wikes, Debbie Mills, my colleague from one of the committees of the Heritage Council and National Trust stalwart David Burton, and thank you, David, for those wonderful remarks before. Also want to acknowledge my colleagues from the Heritage Council who are up here, some of whom are here today, and um, the Heritage Council is nothing if not universally passionate about celebrating, preserving, and, con and protecting heritage, notwithstanding that there is in fact a banker and a lawyer amongst us those professions are not actually incompatible with a passion about heritage, so we are all the stronger for it. Um, recently, the members of the Heritage Council visited two very interesting cultural landscapes, one of which has just been mentioned, I'll come back to. Uh, the first was Braidwood in southern New South Wales, and the other, the Mulgoa Valley, which has just been recognised. And this isn't a setup, by the way, I didn't know that Mulgoa Valley was a winner, even an entry, let alone a winner. Braidwood and its setting is listed on the State Heritage Register and arguably the Mulgoa Valley should be if it could be. And I'm sure that will be strongly supported over there. Both these places illustrate the challenge of listing landscapes and communities under the current New South Wales Heritage Act. Even a community as rich in built heritage as Braidwood is contain many buildings that are of little significance and the owners of those buildings quite reasonably don't want heritage restrictions placed on them of the type that might apply well to, generally speaking, more significant older buildings. The Heritage Act, as it's currently written, has a fairly heavy hand around listed places, and Braidwood is managed through a development control plan that is called up of the Heritage Act, or that calls up the Heritage Act. That works well in parts and doesn't work well in other parts, as the local council pointed out to us. There are ways that that could be better. The Mulgoa Valley is, a significant, is significant because of its importance to Aboriginal people before Europeans. Its significance is a place of sometimes violent interaction between Aboriginal people and Europeans. It's built heritage and it's broader landscape characteristics, sitting as it does against the Nepean River and the foothills of the Blue Mountains. Uh, and on our visit, we had a wonderful uh, tour and outlined by the Friends of Mulgoa Valley and Fernhill, so I thank them for helping us through better understanding of Mulgoa Valley. Main challenges to the Mulgoa Valley are around urbanisation as Penrith City grows to the north and the new airport to, to the south. But the Heritage Act as it currently stands is, I would argue, so it's very personally, entirely unsuited to protecting a landscape such as the, Mul a landscape such as the Mulgoa Valley and arguably it was never intended to do that. Uh, and we, it does need, however, the Mulgoa Valley does need protection. And we're working with Penrith Council on ways of achieving that through planning laws. But that approach is only partially satisfactory. The valley needs much stronger protection than that. Heritage Act is largely a creature of the times of the late 1970s and the drive and inspiration of the late great, it was said, Jack Mundy. 
And while it has served us well in many areas, principally by protecting individual buildings and places, it is dated and arguably now not well suited to 21st century cultural heritage celebration, conservation and protection needs. And I'm sure Don Harwin will talk about that when he speaks to us shortly. I want to do two things. Um, <laughs> one is buy back rather than sell out. I want to talk about a particular potential area of change and I want to urge you to all engage with and engage with as vigorously as you're engaging with this talk now. I want to urge you all to engage with and participate in the review process. Um, and I particularly support the, 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 the fact that there is an award for advocacy in the National Trust Heritage Awards because without advocates, we would have lost so much. Two international approaches to heritage attracted my attention soon after I took over the role as chair of the Heritage Council. One is the multi-tier English system of heritage classification and the other is the approach to heritage protection in New York City. And while that is deeply flawed around things that happened with that wonderful station, as David pointed out, there are other aspects that are interesting. Most of us will have heard reference to a grade one or grade two A or grade two not A listed buildings in the many English historic house TV programs that run at the moment. Uh, and those gradings protect buildings of different levels of exceptional or special interest. The New York system may be less familiar for buildings of heritage interest in New York that are not open to the public. The focus is on protecting exterior streetscapes and neighborhoods with owners able to do more or less as they will for contemporary living needs inside their privately owned dwellings or businesses. However, however, full protection extends to any building that is open to the public or indeed to public areas of otherwise private buildings. Both these systems have aspects worth looking at for New South Wales. If we put aside national and world listings, then essentially New South Wales under the current legislation has two levels of heritage protection, local and state. Local listings in many cases have served us well and will continue to serve us well. Most of the heritage of this state is protected through local heritage listings, but, uh, but are vulnerable to the changing sentiments of local government councils. A building, can be, a building listing can easily be taken away if the attitude of a particular council changes. State listings carry strong protections and once made are hard to take away, but we also have other state legislation that can turn off the protections of the Heritage Act, such as the de Declaration of State Significant Developments. In some cases, this is far... Excuse me, Frank. I'm actually on your side up there on this, if you give me a word. I mentioned in advocacy that it is about tenacity. Please do not confuse tenacity with rudeness. We are here to uh, be respectful and to to hear the views of people and not alienate possible supporters by being rude. I ask you to respect that. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. As I said, we have other legislation that can turn off the Heritage Act. In most cases, in some cases, it's okay, but there are big risks with this system too, and I, for one, personally, don't agree with it. Uh, one response to both these issues is to have a more nuanced multi-category listing system under the Heritage Act. Perhaps there could be both local listings as there are now and maybe a local listing that is harder to remove or amend once made, worth thinking about. Such more resilient local listings might better suit applications to whole neighbourhoods such as Haberfield and whole towns such as Braidwood. These local listings might be more akin to a planning instrument than what we would currently think of as a heritage listing and clearly would have to be in sync with planning laws but would be under the Heritage Act. In addition, we might want a category of listing that better suits cultural landscapes such as the Mulgoa Valley where we are pr dealing primarily with rural and agricultural land, loose, land uses but they must be protected. In terms of individual buildings, we might want a category of listing that focuses on exteriors and public areas and leaves interiors to adapt to the living needs of the day. We're having just that discussion at the moment in Miller's Point. Um, 
this might apply to private houses, but also equally to private office buildings that are worthy of listing for their exteriors and public spaces, but where we need le to leave room for individual owners to innovate within their private spaces. One reason why many arguably heritage significant later 20th century office buildings are not listed is because vehement owner opposition, because of vehement owner opposition, because the Heritage Act is not easy to manage to enable owners to adapt internally. Perhaps we finally, perhaps we should have a listing category that suits extremely significant places with obvious examples like the Sydney Opera House that require the highest level of protection and maybe shouldn't be able to be turned off by other legislation. As I said, these words are very much my view, but a multi-category system is one of the things the Heritage Council is looking at informing its views about one key aspect of a potential new Heritage Act. One other thing that I haven't gone into here because of time and complexity, but it is so, so important in any review of the Heritage Act is around Aboriginal cultural heritage. Let me just say that the current Heritage Act and indeed other pieces of New South Wales legislation such as the National Parks legislation are woefully inadequate in the recognition and protection of Aboriginal cultural heritage and, and enabling self-determination. The Heritage Council is independent, including the bankers and lawyers, and I'm sure there'll be aspects of its views that won't necessarily align with the thinking of the government of the day, but we will make those views known through the parliamentary inquiry process I urge you to make your views known too. I urge everyone in here to become advocates if you're not already, if you aren't already such. The widest possible range of views will give us the best possible outcome in this incredibly important area of celebrating, conserving and protecting the state's heritage. And as David Burden said in his quite effective poem, when it's good, we should defend it. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Now, just chat amongst yourselves. It's David. Frank, sorry. Let me be frank. Sorry about that. Uh, chat amongst yourselves. Enjoy each other's company, and we'll be back in a few minutes with the continuation of the awards. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you very much to Frank Howarth and I hope you all enjoyed your desserts. I appreciate the short break. You might have turned your phone back on, so please make sure you switch to silent. And we are live streaming, so if you do happen to get a call, it could with the, the difficult doing the live streaming. In other words, it'll cut out. We'll move forward now to present the winners of the Adaptive Reuse category of the National Trust Heritage Awards. Jean-Marie Oualz, the American author of the Earth Children books, writes, life is neither static nor unchanging. With no individuality, there can be no change, no adaption, and in an inherently changing world, any species unable to adapt is also doomed. And that can be said for our spaces. Let's celebrate those entries shortlisted for this year's adaptive reuse category, starting with Car Street, Coogee, entered by McGregor Westlake Architecture. <laughs> Cottage Medical, Berry, entered by JX Tall Health. Sub-base platypus in Sydney, entered by Lazin Laznimo Architects. <laughs> and the Sydney Retreat, entered by BTB Architecture Studio and Bronwyn Hanna History and Heritage. A round of applause. I think it's the variety of that shortlist that is wonderful. We have a block of flats in a blue ribbon location in Coogee with an adapted residential design and mixed use at the ground floor. 
a medical practice that could have gone to just about any new build industrial estate to set up a GP surgery, but decided to invest in the health of heritage and create a new use for the old 1860s cottage hospital in Bury. An invaluable piece of naval history in Sydney's Neutral Bay that's been transformed into a community space and an 1880s Victorian Italianate villa that has a new social purpose as a retreat and residential facility for those recovering from alcohol and drug dependency in Stanmore. Yes. The judges have awarded two high commendations in this category and again your certificates will be posted to you after today's ceremony. And the highly, highly commended entries were Car Street Coogee entered by McGregor Westlake Architecture, <laughs> Cottage Medical Berry entered by JX Tall Health. And the winner is Sub Base Platypus, entered by Las Nimo Architects. <laughs> Located on the land of the Camaragal people and formerly a torpedo factory, submarine base, and gas works, Sub Base Platypus has been transformed into community recreation and a work hub in Neutral Bay overlooking the harbour near North Sydney. This wonderful space has been reopened to the public for the first time in 150 years and features a shaded barbecue area with seating, a pocket playground and a scenic waterfront promenade while interpreting the rich history of the place. I'm going there for a weekend coffee in the future. You can read more about it on the Harbour Trust website. But for now, let's celebrate the winner. Uh, thank you. Um, this is the first time we've entered the, the National Trust Award, so I'm very, very excited. I'm going to do it again next year, I think. Um, <laughs> I must thank the uh, Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, a wonderful client. Um, they have such fantastically important lands to look after, um, and they've got a tough gig because they have to get the uh, commercial side of it right as well. Um, and they're under a lot of scrutiny, but I think they generally do a pretty good job, and they've done a wonderful job on this uh, site, so congratulations to them. Um, this is open for the first time for nearly 200 years to the public, so I urge you all to go there and have a look at it. It's linked to, you can catch the ferry from uh, uh, Circular Quay and ma make your way across the new pedestrian bridge we've made from Kesselton Park and just walk your way through there and enjoy it. And, and you should because it's an important part of Sydney's heritage. Um, this, but this whole site could easily have been cleared. There's, this is not heritage with a capital H. Um, what's special about it is the layering that's happened over the years and it's almost the ordinariness of it that's special um, but those things have to be preserved as well so thank you very much i was getting ready for you going over time but at 53 seconds you cleaned it up very well give him a round of applause Now we come to continuing tradition, and this category recognises the continuation of heritage practices, skills, and ensuring the authenticity and rigour in conservation practices that ensures heritage is sustained for future generations. There were two projects shortlisted for this category. The George Proudman Fellowship Program across the whole of New South Wales, entered by the Minister's Stonework Program, and Tuckambul Barn in the Northern Rivers, entered by traditional timber frames. <laughs> Congratulations to both entries. There's a highly commended project in this category, and it is Tuckambul Barn, entered by traditional timber frames. <laughs> so the winner this year, of course, is the George Proudman Fellowship Program. entered by the Minister's Stonework Program. The judges awarded this program with the Continuing Tradition Award in recognition of the support it provides for sustainability of heritage skills in the field of stone masonry. The fellowship supports mid-career stonemasons to enhance their leadership potential and to travel to gain experience. 
There have been five fellowships awarded to date, and while recent fellows have travelled abroad to hone their skills, this year's winner is travelling across Australia investigating the sustainability of stone extraction. So please congratulate the Minister's Stone Work Program. Thanks, Simon. Uh, thank you very much to the National Trust. Um, this is a wonderful endorsement of what has been uh, quite a long-standing fellowship run by Public Works, the Public Works Department um, of New South Wales. Uh, Public Works Advisory is still um, managing this um, fellowship. The purpose of the fellowship, is, as Simon might have said, I wasn't really listening to what you were saying. Sorry, Simon. Um, <laughs> is to continue, uh, to continue the education of, of mid-career stonemasons so that they can become advocates, I can say that word, um, for, for their industry uh, because, you know, we're living in a city, we can all appreciate sandstone is a huge, huge part of our history. Uh, and we have here the inaugural winner of the George Proudman Fellowship in 20, 2001, 2001. And Nick here, who uh, won won the the fellowship this this year, it was the fifth award of the of the fellowship. And Nick is undertaking a really interesting uh, study of sandstone and its its provenance on country and what impact that has on our restoration program. So that's going to be fascinating for all of us. Thanks, guys. might be able to say advocacy, but you can't speak for less than a minute. <laughs> Did you hear me? No, it's okay. <laughs> yes! <sighs> the next line on the script says, education, where would we be without it? The entries put forward in this category inspire curious minds to connect with heritage, learn and understand, be it inspired or moved by it, and hopefully going looking for more knowledge. There are quite a few in the shortlist for this category in 2021, including the interpretations of musical history and family life, Aboriginal history and digital immersion. Here they are. Fairbridge Children's Park, Molong, entered by Clouston Associates. House Music at Your House, entered by Sydney Living Museum. <laughs> CAMA 2020 Commemorative Sculptures, entered by New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service. <laughs> Sydney Opera House, Tours Immersive Digital Experience, or TIDE, entered by the Sydney Opera House. Warren Sydney, entered by Trigger. And the judges have highly commended one of the shortlisted projects, and that is Sydney Opera House Tours Immersive Digital Experience Tide, entered by the Sydney Opera House. So the winner is Fairbridge Children's Park Molong. Entered by Clouston Associates, this lovely natural environment has been dedicated to the story of 1,000 orphans who were sent far away from home in Britain to the hope of a new life at Fairbridge Farm School in Molong, New South Wales. What awaited them and what they experienced was not in keeping with the spirit of that vision. The judges loved that the visitors to Fairbridge Children Park were taken on a journey of winding paths symbolic of the oceans travelling to a new destination. Sensitive storytelling of the tasks and labour and the haunting experience faced by these children in an isolated location in a new land are emotionally evocative and provide knowledge and awareness for visitors and recognition to the survivors of this experience. Well done to everybody involved. He was my boss when I was at Triple J and would let, never let me go over time. So I'm gonna be interested to see how this bit goes. Uh, I'm David Hill and this is my brother Dudley Hill. And Dudley was the superintendent who built the park. Uh, this is a very emotional. 
uh, the child migration story is a pretty sad one. Um, and uh, this magnificent park tells the story of about a thousand kids who, without their parents, uh, were migrated to Australia as young as four years of age. Most of them never to see their parents again. Uh, it's been beautiful. I didn't think it was possible to take five acres of a country bush creekside and to build a park that told the story so beautifully and in such an uplifting way. And the credit for that must go to the genius, the architect, landscape architect, Leonard Lynch. Please stand up, Leonard. And and his professional, professional colleague, Aaron Driver. Can you stand up, Aaron? Stay standing, Leonard. <laughs> Leonard has worked on this project pro bono for three years because we had bugger all money. And it's a magnificent outcome. And on behalf of all the thousand Fairbridge kids, Leonard, thank you. Who is going to run a timer over that? I didn't time it. I'm not going to start telling you what to do. Come on. The amazing thing about David Hill, I'm going off script here, but the amazing thing about David Hill is that he probably met me uh, when I was working on the Gold Coast and he came through to open the new youth station up there and some six years later he came on a tour of Triple J where I'd returned, probably not the Triple J wanted me to return, but I did, and it blew me away because he walked up and said, Simon, I saw you last in the Gold Coast, didn't I? And I was like, wow, he really does watch everything we do. Now, to say it was a tough year for organising any events, exhibitions or tours is an understatement. What a year. The impact of COVID-19 meant that we missed community and connection, coming together in person at events like this awards ceremony. Just going to work became a treat. Coming together with friends and family was highlighted as so important and the absence of having something to do, see experience and enjoy in the realm of sports, arts, culture and heritage was felt very deeply. Despite the challenge, this sector rallied in new and inventive ways through technology, through virtual experiencing and when programming could resume, it did so splendidly. And with that as context, the shortlist for this category is long but well deserved. For events, exhibitions and tours, we look at the shortlist for this category, which is Carrington Road Industrial Heritage, Marrickville, New South Wales, entered by Louisa King and Ali Wright. <laughs> the Coal Loader app, entered by North Sydney Council. <laughs> Dennis Heritage Day in Penrith, entered by the Museum of Fire. Developing Sydney, Capturing Change, 1900 to 1920, entered by the City of Sydney Council. <laughs> Fragile Beauty, Rich and Rare in Sydney, entered by Pamela Pauline Photography. <laughs> Inherit Old and New Histories in Orange, entered by the Orange Regional Museum. Papunya Chula, 50 years, 71 to 21 in Sydney, entered by Utopia Arts, Sydney. <laughs> the Spring Harvest Online Edition, entered by Sydney Living Museum. <laughs> Thresholds by Julia Davis and Lisa Jones in Sydney, entered by Sydney Trains. And Tourist Paradise in Port Macquarie, entered by Port Macquarie Museum. <laughs> so the judges have highly commended Papunya Chula, 50 years, 1971 to 21. <laughs> Thresholds by Julia Davis and Lisa Jones, entered by Sydney Trains. 
and Tourist Paradise entered by Port Macquarie Museum. Now in this category, the judges have awarded a couple of winners for exhibitions, Fragile Beauty Rich and Rare entered by Pamela Pauline Photography. Fragile Beauty Rich and Rare blew the judges away with its intricate detail, exquisitely rich and absorbing images that really conveyed the story of the urgent need to conserve our natural environment. What an absolute honor. I'm sitting next to David here from Fairbridge, and I'm thinking, what can I say after he spoke? Um, but what I would really like to say is that there are so many people um, who are working in conservation who deserve this so much more than me. So I'm just a messenger. So as an artist, I had the opportunity to go behind the scenes and, and uh, create photographic artworks of our endangered species. It, it was a huge honor. I'd just like to thank everybody involved in that project and the National Trust. So thank you. Twenty nine seconds. <laughs> Carrington Road, it's a high bar, she said. They are the winners of the Industrial Heritage Car uh, Carrington Road, the other winner. Carrington Road Industrial Heritage Marrickville is an audio walking tour that takes the visitor through the industrial and mine manufacturing history of the 20th century in Sydney's inner west. The places of focus include the factories of General Motors Holden, Davies Coop, Dooley and Hansford, Riga Products, Technico and Pi. The tour is narrated by Steve Shanahan, illustrated by Antonio Pazenti and is freely available to the public. Uh. So, um, Ali and I, you know, we just met through our, uh, our local primary school, so uh, it's, it's quite an honour to be here amongst such distinguished guests. But thank you to Inner West Council, Marrickville Heritage Society and the Holden Retirees Club. Um, and thank you to all the people that helped us along the way. Um, Robert and Tony Dixon, Howard Grace, Joyce Roy, Dave Stimson, Dennis Grant, they shared significant parts of their lives with us. Thank you to those who helped us deliver the project. Amy Zard, Annabella Silva, Antonia Pacenti and Steve Shanahan and the magnificent support of our families. And now also thank you to the uh, National Trust for recognising our work on Carrington Road. We wanted to create a gift for our neighbours to inspire their interest in local heritage for our children who are still in school to marvel about the past and for our parents and grandparents to, to revel in the significance of their, of their times. The reality of industrial heritage is not pretty. Urban renewal is un probably unstoppable, but we hope to encourage the protection of factories and workplaces of the past so that we can continue to understand their role uh, and, and the importance that they have had in our lives, our economy and in our nation. Uh, as Jack Lang said, uh, factories are the milestones along the road we must travel, and I hope that is the same for heritage too. Um, our Carrington Road project is about the past, but it is as much about the future. It's okay, because you had her 30 seconds. We're at the last of the general categories with heritage resources and publications. And this category celebrates reference texts, books, documents, websites, videos, television, radio, podcasts, pretty much any medium that conveys a story or furthers knowledge in the field of heritage, conservation and culture. We had a great shortlist this year, including the following. Callan Park, Barnett Building's External Fabric Maintenance Plan, an Asset Management and Development Consent Document entered by the Minister's Stonework Program. <laughs> Designing a Legacy, entered by Tim Ross, Modernista Films and Production Group. Vitalising Veteran Car Website, entered by the Veteran Car Club of Australia, brackets New South Wales. 
and the judges have highly commended Vitalising Veteran Car Club website, the Veteran Car Club of Australia. So the final gong in the category awards go for heritage resources and publications goes to somebody who's probably a member of the Veteran Car Club for his Datsun 120Y, Mr Tim Ross of Modernista Films and Production. <laughs> this documentary playfully brings the evolving concept of home design to life. The judges loved the delightful anima animation and Tim Ross's ever-refreshing conversational style that's still packed with substance. Designing a legacy makes appreciation and enjoyment of architecture, placemaking and heritage more accessible, fun and adaptable for new audiences and future generations. Good on you. Uh, thank you, Simon. You always do such a great job. Thank you to National Trust. Um, I was in the cab the other day and the guy said, he said, oh, Rosso, you've really carved out this, uh, this little niche for yourself with these architecture documentaries on the ABC, haven't you? You know, you know. I said, yeah, I have, but I don't think anyone else really wants them. And uh, thank you. And I said, yeah, you're right. Be uh, and uh, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you're right, because if Arne Doe suddenly decides he likes architecture, you're stuffed. So <laughs> I'd like to thank Shelley Kemp, who works for me as a producer, um, and Andrew Garrick, who is the director of this. It's a small project. Uh, it got on television with about a tenth of the budget of uh, an episode of Married at First Sight. Um, <laughs> more than anything, uh, it took four years of my life and, and, and revolved around more no's than yeses, but I really believed in this project. So. Ultimately, what I would like to do is thank all of you in the room who know this script particularly well. All of us at some stage have done things for no money or little money or for a few thanks, um, but we've done it because it's the right thing to do. So uh, I'd like to thank you all f for what you all do for the people of the future. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Fifty-nine, fifty-nine. Close. We've awarded initiatives and projects and now it's time to focus on individuals who have made the extraordinary contributions to the field of heritage. By highlighting excellent in her excellence in heritage skills, we are of course highlighting the excellence that sits behind all the work we've just awarded. Prior to the introduction of low cost rich watches, wrist watches, it's nearly as hard to say as advocacy, low-cost wrist watches, public clocks were integral to everybody's lives, be it on a clock tower, the facade of a public building, or a freestanding. These often acted as landmarks or symbols of civic pride. Think of the great clock towers of Central Railway Station, Sydney Town Hall, and the GPO. Our award this year goes to noted master clockmaker for his role in the conservation and maintenance of important public clocks across Australia and in particular New South Wales. He has clock making in his family for many generations. He established his company following a Churchill Fellowship to Switzerland, Holland and England. In addition to making handmade clocks and watches, he and his team provide high quality conservation and service work for significant clocks and watches. But he also trains existing watchmakers to ensure these skills are not lost. Among their extensive portfolio of exterior public clocks that he and his team have built or restored include the Sydney Town Hall clock, the Port Arthur historic site, and the five metre diameter central station clock in Sydney. This year, Heritage Skills Award goes to Andrew Markening. I will have to say, Simon, that if I'm actually the master of time, I get as much time as I like. <laughs> Take a seat. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. 
Look, I, I'd, I'd actually first and foremost like to thank um, the National Trust, but also to the staff here today. I think we all can give them a round of applause today because I think they've done a great job. The, um, um, look, I, I, I um, don't stand here alone. I stand here with a whole team that's actually behind me, and I'd like to thank all of my staff, but I'd like to thank the um, peak industry body, the Watch and Clockmakers of Australia, but particularly Trent Firth, who's my um, um, uh, backup man in every sort of sense of it. The, um, it's a funny thing with, with, um, with a clock. A clock tells you time and it tells it to you all the time. Um, and then that wasn't meant to be a double over there. But the one thing we get to do is we actually get to tell its story. The, um, we get to unpack it, we get to understand it, uh, and we get to interpret that to make sure that the clocks that we deal with will last for as long as they care to be serviced, looked after, maintained and supported. And um, I think that's really the fundamental nature of what we do with Heritage is, the, um, is if we hold the item in its highest regard and look to see what the essence of that item actually is, we'll ensure it has a history into the future. Thank you. Perfect timing. I'd be very disappointed if it wasn't perfect timing. Well done. For an outstanding female heritage professional, we award the Cathy Donnelly Memorial Prize every year. The Cathy Donnelly Award winner this year has been providing Randwick City Council with her heritage expertise for tw over 20 years. During that time, she's been instrumental in securing statutory protection for many places and has provided efficient and professional heritage advice regarding many hundreds of development applications. This person epitomises the frontline role local government plays in heritage conservation in New South Wales. She's a quiet achiever who is known for her sound advice, thoroughness and efficacy. Her legacy is the conservation and sympathetic adaptive reuse of many, many heritage items, often in vigorous redevelopment contexts and is securing a strong place for heritage in a local council area, which will always benefit from her work. Our Cathy Donnelly Memorial Prize winner for 2021 is Lorraine Simpson. to um, the judges for the recognition. Thank you to the National Trust for this inspiring event. Um, and I'd like to also acknowledge uh, all of those local government heritage planners and heritage advisors that um, do a, a difficult job under often challenging circumstances. Um, I feel a little bit like um, Stephen Bradbury or, or maybe some Stephen, um, female version of Stephen Bradley that somehow emerged from the um, tangle of skates and bodies and still got an award. Thank you. <laughs> Are up in the best speech award so far, so <laughs> our lifetime achievement award. This individual has made thousands of submissions to government to protect heritage sites across New South Wales. He's had triumphs, keeping the powerhouse at Ultimo was just one of them, but he's lost plenty of battles to save our heritage, and yet in the face of that, he has sustained the passion, grit, and grace to keep going. And let's remember that word, grace. He has been the chief custodian of the National Trust Register and one of the leading voices advocating for heritage for 40 years. And that's just his work. He's de dedicated many hours of his life to the cause as well. People who have worked with him freely speak of his good humour, wit, astonishing intelligence and encyclopedic knowledge on a vast array of topics. He has the ability to be incredibly cool under fire. No, much, no matter how much there is to juggle, he is always a delight to work with. And I am, of course, speaking of the former director of the conservation of the National Trust in New South Wales, ladies and gentlemen, Graham Quint. Well, 
this was a surprise. So I'd have to say I'll be within your um, 60 seconds, definitely. I can recall doing an interview years ago with the Competition 2 GB, Clive Robinson, and he said to me, what's your title? And I said, Direc Director of Advocacy. And he said, that's a bit wanky, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so the next week we changed it to, to Director of Conservation. Um, you also mentioned about juggling, and that's really what the job is, uh, because you've got all the people outside the trust, in the trust, the committees, the regional groups, the general public, uh, resident action groups, all wanting whatever help we can give them, and it is a matter of just juggling those balls and keeping them going. And David, I'm tossing them across to you, but I really just want to thank all those people over the years, and there's so many in this room, uh, that I've worked with and I've learnt from um, because I came in as an accountant. Uh, I wasn't trained in, in advocacy or conservation or whatever, so um, it's been the help of all those committee members over the years that uh, has, has let me enjoy this job so much and my wife, Jenny, and a fantastic place to work for. I can't think of a better place to work for. I came out of working for a council and I've worked for the Trust and what a place to work. And thank you very, very much indeed. A big round of applause. So we've now arrived at the big moment, the Judges' Choice Award for 2021. Now I know there are people in the room that have strong feelings they would like to express. I would ask them to choose the moment well and perhaps acknowledge that they have a majority of supporters in this room who would like to keep the being their supporters. To speak today and present to this award is the New South Wales Minister for Heritage, the Honourable Don Harwin. Well, I feel like I'm just come from question time. They even got David here. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin by first of all acknowledging that we're on the land and by the water of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, I pay my respects to their elders past, present and those who will emerge in the future. And I thank them for their custodianship uh, of country and also for keeping alive a culture that is tens of thousands of years old, the, the world's oldest continuing culture. And I'd like to acknowledge the National Trust for again hosting this important event. I acknowledge uh, Neil and Debbie, of course, who provide such great leadership, along with all of the, the board members and committee members and staff. I acknowledge Frank, Frank Howarth, the chairman uh, of the Heritage Council and uh, also the Heritage Council members that are here. Uh, and of course, the Executive Director of Heritage New South Wales, Pauline McKenzie. Uh, David Burden, uh, I'm so sorry that I couldn't be with you uh, to uh, uh, hear what you had to say today, but uh, literally I have come straight from question time. So uh, there you go, uh, I am sorry about that. As always, today's awards provide us with an opportunity to reflect upon, acknowledge and celebrate the year's uh, achievements in innovation, conservation, sustainable reuse and advocacy. Today and over the 27 year history of these awards, we've recognised the invaluable work being done year after year to pr protect, conserve and promote heritage in New South Wales. I congratulate all the nominees and winners uh, recognised uh, today for their de dedication uh, to heritage, even you Suzette. Uh, the New South Wales Government is committed to working with communities and heritage stakeholders to celebrate, protect and manage uh, environmental, movable and Aboriginal cultural heritage across New South Wales. That's why we've embarked upon a review of the management of our state's heritage. The Government's a discussion paper released in April is designed to elicit ideas and innovation to reform New South Wales heritage legislation. This reform is about making it easier, more affordable and more desirable to own and conserve state heritage. 
We want to deliver better conservation outcomes and see more heritage properties lived in, uh, adaptively reused, loved and of course cared for by the community. The New South Wales Government has commenced a long overdue uh, review to the heritage legislation in New South Wales. This review is the start of a collaborative and public process. The New South Wales heritage legislation is being reviewed to deliver more effective, relevant and best practice ways of recognising, conserving, reusing and celebrating the important heritage of New South Wales. I've asked the New South Wales Legislative Council Social Issues Standing Committee to conduct an inquiry into the adequacy of the Heritage Act. They'll undertake in extensive consultation. They'll call for submissions. They'll hear from stakeholders and all of that will be to support the inquiry they're undertaking. The committee's now accepting submissions on their website until 27th of June 2021 and I encourage you to share your expertise and your perspective with them. The findings delivered by the Standing Committee will be considered by Government and inform drafting of amendments to our heritage legislation. The Heritage Act has not been substantially updated since 1999 and this is an opportunity to make sure that Act is fit for purpose. The Government's discussion paper relieved, uh, released in April poses the question, what sort of regulatory model would facilitate the preservation, activation and celebration of our state's heritage? The discussion paper is the start of what will be a consultative and public process of updating the Act. Some ideas canvassed uh, uh, already, uh, as I understand, um, mentioned by uh, Frank Howarth, include introducing category heritage listing and management and a management system to replace the existing one-size-fits-all approach, improving heritage considerations in the planning process and streamlining interactions between the Heritage Act and the planning system to make them more transparent and provide better planning outcomes for heritage. Consideration of new incentives to make it easier to undertake cons conservation works, uh, activate and adaptively reuse state heritage. And finally, consideration of new compliance and enforcement powers, as the Herit Heritage Act currently has no intermediate enforcement mechanisms. I'm confident that with broad community out input, the outcomes of the, this review will make it easier, more affordable and more desirable to own and use state heritage, policy, heritage properties. The New South Wales Government is also currently consulting uh, with uh, key Aboriginal stakeholders in Aboriginal cultural heritage management. I'm committed to the co-design of reforms with them and all around um, and they're all around the table uh, right now and committing uh, to uh, finalising these reforms in this parliamentary term. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, there have been lots of winners today and I want to congratulate them, as I said earlier. Uh, I'm delighted to see that so many uh, of the nominees are associated with state government projects uh, as well. Uh, I loved hearing David uh, about um, the Fairbridgians. It was a great project, uh, and you were right. Uh, with just under 800,000, so much was uh, achieved, uh, and the state government through the Regional Cultural Fund was very, very honoured to provide 500,000 uh, of that money. Uh, but there are so many people in, in the room who've uh, done so much good, and it's been not an easy job at all for the judges to try uh, and uh, pick winners in each of the categories. But a, a, bit, like the, uh, a bit like the Archibalds, really, uh, the judges uh, have their equivalent of the Packing Room Prize, and it's called the, uh, the Judges Award. Uh, and it's customary for them uh, to pre present the Judges Award to, uh, well, I suppose it's their favourite project, um, uh, one they choose. Uh, and so it's with great pleasure that I can announce the Judges Award for 2021. And the winner is 
Leagues Club Park Gosford entered by the Hunter Central Coast Development Corporation. And congratulations uh, to them. Thank you again to the National Trust for putting on this ceremony. Thank you so much to the judges for all you've done. Uh, and uh, also, uh, even if you haven't been uh, a winner or highly commended, just to be, oh, here they are. Excellent. <laughs> I was worried they weren't coming. Didn't want to leave any pregnant pauses. I might get a problem, get a bit of a touch up from Simon. Anyway, here's our photo. <laughs> Metaphorically speaking. <laughs> All right, who's going to say something? Wow. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, National Trust, and thank you, judges. We are absolutely thrilled to see this project nominated, well, this project winning the Judges' Choice Award, and to see a celebration of Aboriginal heritage, public spaces, and the Central Coast community um, celebrated by this award, which are probably three things that you don't often see listed, uh, listed together. I really hope that through the excellence of this project and the profile of this award, that our engagement with the Dark and Jung and the project outcomes can help others on a greater pathway to reconciliation and also inspire others to increase their Aboriginal cultural awareness and embed it more in their projects. Thank you. I'd just like to th say thank you to the National Trust and um, also um, as the artists working on the design, um, the actual poles represent an old, well, it's a very old story that our people have been meeting um, at a sacred mountain we call Mount Yango for thousands of years and we've brought this story down to the waterfront. It's about also, I think, giving the waterfront back to the people too. Um, Arthur Phillip came up here five weeks after they landed the first fleet and he inspected Broken Bay and he met our people up there at Patonga Beach and Pearl Beach and then into Brisbane Water. And the canoes represent our people being there, which Arthur Phillips said looked like a mini marina at the time. <laughs> and, um, you know, interacting with our people. But the importance is too, today as um, Aboriginal people, seeing that our culture is recognised in the architecture of um, Australian design and too, which... Um, I think it should be more, a lot more, um, in 200 years, uh, over 200 years, and where you don't see a lot of Aboriginal um, architectural story or design within the work itself. Bank Barangaroo, just across the way here, um, has done that here in Sydney. And, um, yeah, so I'm very proud of that, and I like to see more of it done. And I thank um, Central Coast Hunter um, for all their beautiful work. Hi, my name my name's BJ Duncan. I'm a board member of Dark Dung Lands Council. I'm actually Gav's first cousin. So Gav's father and my father were brothers. Um, some people say, why are you so fair? And I just tell them that I was born on a lightning strike. <laughs> but look, um, we're not Dark and Jung people by, by any means. We're Gomeroy, we're originally from Moree, uh, northwestern New South Wales, and Minister, we have a bit of a connection because my cousin's boy was your former advisor, Rick Haynes, uh, that you, you probably knew really well. Um, but as a board member of Dark and Jung, we're very proud to be involved with the Leeds Club Park development. Now, um, turn your minds back to 1960, in a dark old age in this country. Both Gavin and I were born in a segregated ward. There wasn't uh, a doctor on duty, when I was born anyway. My old aunties brought me into the world, and they constantly remind me that they could take me out of the world. <laughs> I come from a strong matriarchal family, the Aboriginal Medical Service on the Central Coast is named after my mother, which is the Eleanor Duncan Aboriginal Health Centre. Um, proud to say just recently they bought a $1.5 million former nursing home on Wine River. 
that it's going to be our local medical service for our community as well. We're very, we're very much, and I'm Simon, I'm sorry I'm going to go over your minute, but after 60,000 years you could allow me another 30 seconds. <laughs> we're quite advanced in the fact that our community is developing a lot of things for our community. One of the things we're passionate about now, and I want to leave this with you why, when I step off the stage, is the Uluru Statement from the Heart about constitutional recognition for Aboriginal people. And I will leave you with this thought. You won't lose 250 years of history. You'll gain 60,000 years of the richest, longest surviving culture in this country. Part two. Uh, so look, I, I just uh, want to completely finish by uh, applauding everyone for your commitment to looking after and pre presenting our state's uh, heritage. By working together to protect and celebrate heritage, we will maintain and cherish the character of our communities and really, it really has been a pleasure to be with you uh, here today. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Minister, and congratulations to all the people involved in the Lees Club Park at Gosford. It looks amazing. What a great project to take out. The Judges' Choice Award, which concludes our ceremony today. You can watch a video celebrating our winners and share it from the National Trust's YouTube channel on their Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter feeds this evening. Share the photos from today and celebrate yet another great year at the National Trust Heritage Awards. For winners in all the categories, we'll be having a photograph with the National Trust's President, Neil Wykes, on the deck in just a moment. So if you have one, please gather round the deck area so you can be in that photo and make your way out there. Lyndall Stewart will lead you and our photographer Yanni. Thank you for joining us today here in Sydney or online through our live stream. Thank you to our sponsors and supporters, the New South Wales Government and the Heritage Council of New South Wales, to Laithwaite's Edelman and to Daltone House. Thank you to our speakers, thank you to all the entrants and of course congratulations to our winners and nominees this year. But thank you to everyone here for supporting the National Trust by attending the awards ceremony. It's my, been my pleasure to be your MC. I look forward to actually shaking your hands next year in 2021. Have a good one, thank you, good afternoon.